Hi, everybody. I am with Anna A. So I'm super excited to have this conversation with Anna. Um, I've worked with Anna for like a long time now, like six years, six years um, on Outreachy. Um, and uh, many of you may know Anna from Outreachy. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to them because we have this um, uh, because Anna has amazing perspectives on software freedom, on diversity in tech, and a whole variety of issues. And I just really wanted you all to get to know them. So welcome, Anna. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. Thank you so much for your invite. I was super, super excited when you talked to me about this idea of recording this. Well, I really want to know your software freedom origin story. Can you tell me, like, how did you get involved in free software? How did you hear about free software? What made us so lucky is to get you into this movement? I remember when I got my first smartphone, it was a Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy Y or Young. And it didn't have a lot of capabilities, but it was very hackable. So I discovered the world of custom rooms at the time, uh, starting in installing alternative software, software outside of the Play Store, just securing around, messing around with my own phone. It had very little limited memory, so I wanted to remove some really invasive apps and all. And that's kind of how I got into uh, hacking and also uh, some open source project. I, the idea was there, but I didn't have a really good grasp of the philosophies behind it. It was only when I entered university in 2013 and I had a professor for a class that it was uh, programming for engineering, basically. Uh, he refused to use MATLAB. He only wanted to use Scilab, which is an open alternative. And he was very adamant of just uh, accepting submissions for assignments in open formats. He didn't want to deal with proprietary formats. And he encouraged me to attend FLISOL, uh, the Latin American uh, Free Software Installation Festival that happens every year in many, many cities of Latin America. That was my first free software conference, the first time that I had, I watched a couple of talks talking not only about free software tools, but also some of the philosophies behind free software, uh, the freedoms of free software. And that was also where I, uh, met my spouse. <laughs> so, uh, and he was uh, my main encouragement to install Linux for the first time and learn more about free tools. Uh, he was already into uh, computing. He was a computer science student and also really into hacking, really into free software. So he was the one who guided me through changing from proprietary tools to uh, free tools and guided me a lot in many, many years uh, in my search for a free alternatives. So install Ubuntu and then install Debian and then install uh, Arch Linux and then install Fedora. Just distro hopping and learning more and more about how uh, the Linux kernel works, how Linux distributions work. I have always been a very curious person so the idea of having a system, an operating system that just welcomes uh, tickering and messing around and the idea also that I could mess up it completely but have a backup and get up and running immediately like in just 30 minutes or less was what really helped me uh, get more and more experimental with the things that I had. And also the fact that I had really old hardware <laughs> when I entered university. Uh, at the time that I became uh, an outreach intern, my laptop was uh, had a bunch of tape holding it together. <laughs> and that machine uh, got me through university at the time and also uh, helped and supported a lot of that, those experimentations because it was really uh, fairly universal hardware, really easy to get all distros working. So that really got me going in the use of free software. It was only in 2017 uh, when I took a class of Python 
uh, with one of the uh, leaders of the my local free software movement. He uh, introduced me to Python, introduced me to the idea that I could uh, I could code. I I did some very timid coding in my time as a mechanical engineering undergraduate, but he was very ex he, he was great. He was helping us use um, math and SVG to create graphs and other kinds of visualizations. It was really, really cool. You introduced me to a new idea of what coding could be like. And around the same time, there was a women in technology conference happening in my city and an outreachy intern, Alum Anahuchi was giving a lightning talk at that conference about Google Summer of Code and outreachy. And I found that really interesting. I searched for both of those. Uh, I didn't really connect with Google Summer of Code at the time, but I remember connecting a lot to the vision of Altrichi. And I kind of saved that idea for later because I think it was just after the May 2017 cohort, people were already selected. I didn't have the time to actually apply to the May 2017 cohort. But at the same time in 2017, I started getting really irritated at the way things were going with Twitter. And a friend of mine introduced me to something called Mastodon. I joined a couple of instances of Mastodon, ended up in an instance called I'm in Space, in reference to Portal. <laughs> and I'm in the space. community, yeah. <laughs> and and the community there, there really embraced me. I think it was the first time ever in my life where I was posting in English and self-taught. I never had a, a formal English education and I was really shy about posting English, but people were really encouraging. Uh, people interacted with me a lot. I would post a lot in the global timeline and follow other people and interact with other people. I think it was, uh, I was talking to a couple of people today about uh, the Fediverse and other social media that was very important to the lives of Brazilians. Uh, and a lot of them compare Fediverse to Orkut, uh, which was a, a Google-sponsored social media platform in the early 2000s. And I kind of feel like the Fediverse is the, uh, the next big thing for me in my life uh, after Orkut, because I really got that sense of community, that sense of people were seeing each other for, for what they are, they are not really uh, just a reduction of their own selves. You see other people as those really complicated beings with uh, many interests and many things going on in their lives rather than just uh, one single aspect of themselves because the algorithm really pushes you to just be, oh, I'm the free software person or I am the uh, illustrator person or, or I am the gardener person and I cannot be anything else because if I if I try to talk about other things the algorithm won't push the posts I'm making on Twitter or Instagram or etc. So the community was so great and people were so welcoming. They were so uh, open to have someone who couldn't express themselves as well in English as they could in Portuguese. Uh, that I ended up making a lot of friends over there and got to a point where I really wanted to thank them for that kind of uh, hospitality. I started looking into Macedon as a free and open source project rather than just as, as a, plot, a platform as it was first presented to me. And reading the source code of Macedon, I realized that the Brazilian Portuguese translation, as it standard, as it stood at the time, uh, was uh, very similar to the European Portuguese translation. Uh, some strings were very similar or the same, and it wasn't really completed. Uh, Macedon was evolving really fast at the time, so a lot of localization files were missing, so there wasn't a, an official Brazilian Portuguese translation of the Macedon software at the time. And 
I was getting into Git, uh, the idea of contributing to Git. I was participating in some GitHub discussions at the time around the Macedon project. So I decided, let me see if I can translate that in, uh, that software into Brazilian Portuguese. I did a bunch of things I had never done before, like installing uh, a GPG key <laughs> or uh, running a, a suite of tests to see if my localization files were correct, running correctly and being uh, shown correctly to a user or not. Uh, I've done an extensive research on how specific things uh, were translated into Brazilian Portuguese in other projects. So uh, how do you translate specific jargon? Uh, it took me a couple of days and many, many hours, but I got to a point where I finally got all the files that were missing. I, I translated all the strings and at the time Macedon didn't use WebLate. I'm not sure if they still use it now. Uh, so there wasn't an automated uh, platform for translation where you can just see the string and make a translation. You had to really uh, take a look at the code and create new files. I submitted my first pull request really afraid that I was doing something wrong. <laughs> It was my first time ever uh, dealing with Git, dealing uh, with the GitHub interface. I, as I, I mentioned uh, in passive that I was a mechanical engineering student. I didn't start in tech. I was uh, creating a completely different professional path at the time to myself. And that pull request got accepted and other uh, pull requests were accepted, the community was really happy about having a Brazilian Portuguese translation. And things started getting, th things developed really quickly. Uh, the Ministry of Culture in Brazil uh, created an instance for all the laboratories that were involved in free software. Uh, one person, uh, Renato Londe, he uh, decided to create uh, an instance for Brazilians in the Fed first, so he created macedonte.com.br. And this instance I moderated for a couple of years. Uh, other Brazilian instances started to appear, and all of a sudden uh, the Brazilian community started to uh, gather in spaces that were crafted, created by Brazilians, because at the moment, at that point in time, I would see a lot of Brazilians in the uh, Portugal instance, master.pt. We didn't really have our own spaces. And I, th I think I can say now that having that Brazilian Portuguese translation of Macedon really encouraged people to make Macedon their own. We saw an increase of Macedon, uh, Brazilian Macedon instances in the last, I would say, four years with the creation of instances that are not focused in tech. So you have instances for uh, Black and other people of color. You have instances for uh, LGBTQ uh, people. You have instances based on uh, the idea of reclaiming social media. You have instances that are based on specific regions of Brazil. Things really flourished for Brazilian communities after that. And other people got involved in the localization of, of Macedon and other related software. I myself translated uh, Tusky, which is an Android client for Macedon and some alternative from ends for Macedon. It really uh, changed the way uh, Brazilians interacted with the Fediverse and also changed the way I interacted with free software. I interacted with free software as a user and now I was participating in the activity of developing free software, furthering uh, free software. And that newfound self-confidence was what I needed to apply to all free G later that year in 2017. It was my first time applying. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> uh, 
I rem I think it was on the older website for all three G. Um, and I don't remember if it was still on GNOME servers, but it was the old version of the website. And I remember telling my spouse I wasn't sure I was going to be selected. I have a video uh, of me playing Animal Crossing New Leaf on my birthday at that in that year, and though the villagers in Animal Crossing ask what was your wish for your birthday, and I have video proof of me typing being selected for all three G. <laughs> The project, I, the project I applied to was related to localization and internationalization. It was a Wikimedia community project uh, talking about user guides on MediaWiki.org. And I thought that would be uh, the best project for the kind of skills I had at the time. And also really interesting because uh, it was a really research-focused project. It wasn't like many other projects I had seen at the time that were really coding uh, or other technical skills that I didn't feel confident about. And I remember I even wrote about this in a recent blog post. I had some self-doubt issues in that I was afraid I wouldn't be selected because I remember there were I think Wikimedia had like five spots, five internship spots and six projects. And most of the projects were code, code related. Mine was one of the few, if not the only one that didn't involve code at all, if you didn't want to involve code. And I remember uh, spending hours, uh, nights looking for arguments to say this project is really important for the sustainability of your community. And that was when I, I got into understanding uh, things like governance of free software communities or how uh, a diverse pool of people participating in the free software community can really uh, push it forward. Um, I worked really hard on my final application at the time, building those arguments and just trying to uh, make people believe that, yeah, my project had a lot of merit. Maybe uh, it was one of the most important projects that Wikimedia was offering at the time. And I was surprised to see I was selected. <laughs> my spouse told me he wasn't. <laughs> he knew uh, the whole time that I would be selected. Uh, but I, I think it took me a while to actually, uh, understand that it was happening. I was going to work, uh, with the Wikimedia community. I was selected and I was given the chance to see if I wanted to continue, uh, pursuing a mechanical engineering degree, or I wanted to switch careers into tech. That was, that's one of the reasons why the internship was so important to me. It was the first time I was interacting uh, by voice and video with people uh, primarily speaking English. I remember uh, sending an email to my mentors asking them to be very, very patient with me because it will be my first time with the kind, this kind of experience. I remember running around trying to make sure I had a bank account set up to receive these type in payments. I didn't even have a bank account at the time. <laughs> uh, it really changed me, the experience. It really, especially as a super person, I thought I, I would be dependent on my parents for my whole life. And I didn't have any, I wouldn't have that many prospects in uh, as a professional, uh, it helped me with the, with the realization that I was, I could be a, an amazing professional if I was given the chance. It helped me, uh, develop the work ethics that I still hold today. It helped me, uh, expand my world in many, many ways. I 
I live in a, in a city that didn't exist a uh, hundred years ago. It was developed pretty late in the grand scheme of the Brazilian, of Brazilian history. Uh, we are, I would still consider my city to be uh, very isolated from the rest of the world in many aspects. And all of a sudden I was, have, I was having conversations with people from all over the world and contributing uh, with people from many different walks of life and it really expanded my view of life in general. It was, I, as a, someone who spent most of their adolescence and adulthood in, on the internet, I was already in that process, uh, but Altrichi uh, really uh, made that process of contacting and living and experiencing uh, other cultures and being a part of a global community much more present in my life as a process. And uh, kind of as the way I, as I prefer to live life, uh, I just I just enjoy connecting with other cultures, uh, learning other people other people's languages, learning about their countries, the way they live, and what they can bring to the table in terms of not only technical contributions but contributions as a whole, their their stories, their uh, everything really. I I really enjoy. Uh, the kind of uh, life that I feel uh, n virtual and real life, not separate, but as interconnected parts and, uh, and in a way uh, provoking and having a much bigger impact on other people's lives that I could ever imagine. That's so cool. And, I, you know, in return, it's impossible to imagine what outreach would be like if you weren't an organizer of the program now. So I love hearing your your journey and hearing how uh, outreach was a big part of that because you're a big part of outreach's story. But in the time that you've been talking, I have filled a whole page with notes <laughs> of things that I want to ask you based on what you, what you were saying. There's so much. So we're not going to be able to get to everything today but i have a few things that i want to that I'll, I'll start with and maybe we'll do a second one of these we'll see but um but uh one of the things that i wanted to follow up on was that you know i loved hearing how that professor was an important part of your um your journey and that was true for me too i also was an, an was an engineer in undergrad and it was a professor that introduced me to like the ethical side of software and also to uh you know having me um uh, I worked in the computer center and I was installing Linux labs a million years ago. Um, so I, I loved hearing about that and how um, he got you to Feastlay, like, um, uh, which was such an important conference. I attended that conference and I loved it. And the reason why it was so amazing was because there were there was such a strong Brazilian free software community. There were so, it was, you know, it was people who were passionate about software freedom and um, and the conversations that I had there were amazing. And every year after that, I think the conference got smaller and smaller. So I'm not sure if it still happens, but how is the free software community in Brazil? How much was that community a part of your journey? And, um, you know, I think how how was it as a young person coming into that community when I think it was already at that point? I would say that I joined the free software community right uh, me to end of the golden years of free software in Brazil, as I can call it. Uh, it was There was um, a lot of public interest in free software in Brazil, a lot of, a lot of support from the federal government. Uh, which made uh, so many investments in free software projects, not only in the implementation and adoption of free software in uh, public administration. So let's say moving away from uh, Microsoft Windows to uh, Linux distribution, but also funding projects that were created in Brazil. I my My participation in that community was more localized because at the time I didn't have the 
uh, the resources to actually go to Fizzly. So I participated in a lot of Fleetsaw editions and some uh, of the editions of FGSL, which was the uh, the state free software uh, conference. And it's interesting because I had a lot of contact with some of the leaders of my free software community and I participated in, in a lot of those conferences, but maybe because I was very young at the time, maybe because there was kind of a sense that it would keep happening, things would keep, uh, the, things would continue uh, from for an uh, undisclosed amount of time. Uh, that when things started to win down, especially after 2016, uh, we didn't, I didn't feel like my free software community had an idea of, okay, I think we need to train the next generation of free software activists, uh, contributors and leaders. Uh, people try to carry their torch and try to uh, continue many of the events, especially in my city, the capital city of my state. But the uh, FGSL, for example, went from being a, a really big conference and really big deal in my state to being just a community at a campus party and now it's dormant. Uh, Flissol doesn't happen anymore in my city. Still happens in a couple of uh, smaller cities in my state and a couple of small, smaller cities in Brazil, which I think is fantastic to decentralize uh, that conversation of free software from the capitals to uh, other cities, other smaller cities. But uh, I feel like uh, those, uh, the impeachment of Dilma herself in 2016 and the decrease in public investment in free software communities. And then uh, the project that I, uh, the free, Brazilian free software project, I was a part of Tynacan that was uh, conceptualized and developed in my university, ended up leaving for the uh, University of Brasilia, which is the capital city of Brazil. Uh, so many of their researchers were uh, going to pursue a doctorate in that university. So a lot of people ended up leaving and with the decrease of funding, a lot of people had to leave the project altogether those things and also there was uh, a lot of internal fragmentation as well uh there's some controversy around these and i there's a lot i don't know because i think uh as of now i'm kind of doing some free brazilian free software archaeology where i'm trying to uncover uh what has happened to the brazilian free software and a lot of it isn't really well documented or a lot of it will only be uncovered if I talk to the right people. Uh, so if you were a, free so a Brazilian free software person, please talk to me. I want to interview you. Not, not to publish maybe, but just to, to know what happened. Uh, a lot of people ended up leaving my city for other cities or other countries uh, so that the will to continue those conferences ended up uh, living with them. <laughs> they, uh, I think the pandemic was a big, fact, a big factor for the Brazilian free software community. Uh, we, it caught us by surprise. It caught, very, uh, it caught a lot of public universities at the time by surprise. Uh, my university, for example, wasn't, didn't have the necessary infrastructure ready for remote classes. We ended up having to spend like six months preparing for uh, remote classes during the height of the pandemic. And uh, a lot of that ended up making universities adopt proprietary solutions. Uh, Google in specific to, and Microsoft uh, took a lot of advantage of the fact that people were uh, scrambling for uh, using quick solution. And we basically surrounded our infrastructure to Google at this point. Like the uh, emails that we have in my university are all uh, tied to Google. Uh, our classes were uh, hosted on Google Meets or whatever Google calls it, <laughs> because it's been, uh, they had a lot of interactions at this point in time. Uh, 
we not that the Brazilian uh, government of Brazil as a whole doesn't adopt open solutions like big blue button. We do have infrastructure that uses big blue button, but for some reason, maybe uh, because it was so weakened by the uh, lack of support and the decrease in funding, uh, those, uh, oh, and also a change of direction, uh, President Michel Temer, uh, who got in power after Dilma's impeachment, uh, resumed a contract with Microsoft. And that kind of marked an end to uh, public policy of free software in the Brazilian government. All of that ended up uh, weakening the free software movement who was uh, so tied to the movements within universities and the movements within public administration. That was uh, a subject that a lot of people talked about uh, during the um, week of free software in Brazil that I participated in September, at the end of September. Uh, there was someone, uh, there were a couple of people talking about how public administration needs to invest in free software and invest in initiatives furthering free software because it's it's really, let's be honest, really hard to, uh, to start something without some financial investment. And we are not, we are starting to do a little better in, ter in economic terms, but not that great for a while in, in Brazil. Uh, and there were a lot of people uh, defending direct action, like not waiting for public administration to in, to realize that we are important, not waiting for, pu for public administration support, just uh, getting your computer out and talking to people, talking to people uh, in your local prefecture, talking to people in local organizations and spreading the word of free software, helping them uh, start using free software through infrastructure, start using free software tools. Uh, so there's a divide in, in, the, in the direction of, in what direction free software uh, in Brazil uh, should uh, adopt. I don't think those two ideas are uh, exclusionary, that you can do both of them at the same time. But I do feel a lot of people a lot of people's despair and frustration at the public administration because the EU should be a huge part of the Brazilian free software. It still is in some capacity. Uh, some Brazilian free software is still funded by the Brazilian government, either in a state at state level or federal level or a city of state level. Uh, but uh, that decrease in investment, that decrease in support definitely impacted uh, the how much we could do in terms of scale. And that internal fragmentation also made a lot of people uh, look for opportunities elsewhere. I would say that I am, I am one of those people. I couldn't find a way to continue working with free software in Brazil in a more stable way. Like I was a research assistant in Tynacan and I had a brief contract with Labs UNB uh, to translate the uh, public code, public money uh, expert brochure from Free Software Foundation Europe. But those contracts, uh, they had an end date. Uh, they weren't really permanent and I couldn't find financial stability in working with free software in Brazil, not uh, as someone who didn't, uh, who wasn't pursuing a bachelor's degree. I ended up uh, leaving mechanical engineering and at the university again as an information systems undergraduate, set to graduate next year, hopefully. And, but options are limited when you don't have a higher education diploma in Brazil. That's still a criteria that basically remove many opportunities from my reach. And I found that I found opportunities that were more open to the fact that I didn't have higher education diploma uh, outside Brazil in organizations like Software Freedom Conservancy and in uh, programs like Google Seasonal Docs, where I ended after the program and I ended up working with Open Collective for, for almost two years. Uh, it's, 
one of the reasons why I see other people I know who work for uh, foreign organizations have left the realm of free software in Brazil. Uh, for the amount of experience we have and the amount of knowledge we have acquired over the years, uh, foreign organizations tend to welcome us more, tend to uh, not have hard criteria like a high, uh, high education, higher education diploma. And once you get to the point where you're working with global North organizations, it's hard to make the transition back to the to our local market. It's really weird. The trans the experiences that I've had uh, in global North organizations don't necessarily translate one to one to what the Brazilian market expects. So you ended up just fun furthering your relationship to organizations in the global north and disconnecting yourself more and more from the global south. What I want to do, what I've been trying to do, and it's one of the reasons why I participated in the uh, Brazilian Free Software Week uh, that was organized by the Free Software Movement in Brazil, which is a, a new association that has uh, is in uh, after Association Software Libre or Software uh, Free Software Association in Brazil uh, basically became dormant, is that I'm trying to. Uh, find a way to bridge uh, the reach that I have in global North organizations and also some of the financial opportunities uh, some global North organizations offer and associations and uh, organizations in the global South and help them scale back to the point we were uh, in the mid 2010s or we were having more conferences. We were having we we had the opportunity and the resources to build those places of where everyone could connect and where everyone could support each other, and not necessarily do that on on a volunteer uh, as a volunteer. I know that I know especially <laughs> in special to me. Like when I I was uh, I didn't have as many financial responsibilities as I have now or had to uh, support my uh, family in so many ways, it was easier for me to be a volunteer, to volunteer my time to many free software initiatives, to uh, spend my time uh, furthering those initiatives uh, without being paid. But as you get older and responsibilities grow, especially in Latin America cultures where uh, a, lot of, a lot of, oftentimes family depends on you a lot. It's really hard to do those things without being paid. And so that's what I've been trying to achieve, uh, going back to the global South communities and listening to what they have to say to their pain points and uh, where we are at the moment. I, I want to find uh, ways to use the reach and kind of the soft power that I have today uh, to uh, help my, uh, my local communities in the ways that I know that I can help. Do you think that, you know, it's so interesting hearing about the ways in which you've interacted with free software in Brazil and I mean, what, what is the outlook now, do you think, in Brazil going forward? I mean, I, I know, uh, I, I remember thinking, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, like, Brazil is the place. Um, and, uh, you know, and then recently when uh, we had everything happen in Brazil with Twitter, it sort of seemed like maybe there was an opportunity um, locally to get people excited about it. Do you, Find that happening? Do you think? Um, what do you think the outlook is now in Brazil? I think there's there are a lot of people really interested in get the ball rolling again. Uh, I there are some pain points to that where people are trying uh, discussions. The global north has uh, already. Do we stay in proprietary platforms and try to? 
uh, help people understand more about free software in those platforms or do we strictly use free software platforms or like I there was a uh, a whole discussion about how one of the uh, about people using uh, proprietary software to present uh, talks in free software conferences, and there's a whole layer of access accessibility issues pertaining to Linux uh, that may make someone use Windows or Mac OS instead. I know a lot of blind people who prefer Windows for NVDA, which is free software. So uh, I think the free software community in Brazil now is trying to find their footing uh, in many ways, where we stand now, uh, what we can do to resurrect some of initiatives or even assess if some initiatives deserve to be resurrected. Uh, I think a lot of people have realized that uh, True uh, total full unification is impossible. Some fragmentation has happened because it had to happen. Uh, some people really, uh, some people weren't really great in, in our community. Some people were really toxic to minoritized groups in our communities, as has happened in the global north. And so, some fragmentation, some uh, disruption was necessary to. Uh, for us to overcome a certain leadership or certain people or certain initiatives. So we need to, uh, we don't need to resurrect those. We need to create something new. And I think in a way that also connects to the way uh, Brazil, to the decisions Brazil has to do uh, pertaining to the way we use social media platforms. Uh, I had a I had a text uh, that I had to uh, change several times over the last couple of weeks about this uh, in preparation for uh, this conversation because uh, X was banned in Brazil at the end of August, August thirty first, and at the end of September, X was imploring uh, the Supreme Court to <laughs> uh, to unban X in the country, and as of today, X is operating normally in the country uh, i was i was writing about how uh it's important to emphasize that mastodon and by extension the protocol activity pub is not the end all of the centralization of the social web that we need to acknowledge that current ideas of decentralization are the result of a collective of collective initiatives, ideas, and people. So things that we're doing now are transformative. There were things before us, and there will be things after us. We don't. We cannot not acknowledge that we are part of a process. We are not ending the process or creating uh, something necessarily new. We are doing transformations. And I was worried about how the mainstream narrative of decentralization I was very concerned about the uh, the technicalities of decentralization. So decentralized infrastructure, so activity pub and things like oh blue sky uh, and atmosphere, while while forgetting to bring light to another aspect of decentralization that I find really important, which is the decentralization of power. And this is another thing that the Brazilian free software community has to find their footing. Uh, we mirror a lot of our things, or a lot of our conferences, a lot of our behaviors uh, from the things that we observe in the global north. And Again, these the talks about alternative to uh, X, uh, the talks about a uh, Macedon defense versus as a whole is very centralized in the global war. Uh, are we, when we talk about a free software in Brazil or a decentralization or X or Macedon or the Fedverse, are we talking about? Dismantling or enforcing current power structures. I often find the latter to be true in mainstream conversations, 
Uh, and that has been a subject of discussion on Macedon and the Fediverse as a whole a lot. Uh, how uh, Black and POC perspectives are erased in Fediverse and on Macedon. And a lot of the answers that we can find for those questions, they will require people to listen in silence to in the company of their own discomfort to reflect about what they have been told in a long period of introspection it won't be noisy it needs to be quite uh, quiet and reserved the impression that i've had in my time in the field first is that some of the most prominent actors in the mainstream narrative of the construction of the field first haven't been taught to stop and listen stop talking and listen to different perspectives. I think Brazilians need to do that as well in terms of how they want to develop their relationship, to continue developing their relationship to social media platforms. Uh, these um, 30 to 35 day uh, pause in our interaction to X has given us an opportunity to think what kinds of relationships we want to have to social media platforms. Uh, we need to rethink our goals and boundaries of connection and rules of interactions. Uh, the social web, the decentralized distributed federated open networks, uh, they offer an opportunity for a radical paradigm change in our usage of the internet. But we have to be open for those conversations, both Brazilian users of social media platforms and also the free software community in Brazil. Uh, we also need to propose new systems that are ready to detach themselves from what made a uh, corporate initiative such a toxic environment in the first place and reinvent paradigms in the ways we interact and connect. I don't think it's sustainable for us to keep redoing a copy of Twitter or for the free software community in Brazil to uh, do the uh, Americanized version of free software, but make it Brazilian, but a bunch of Brazilian flags. Uh, we need to see more radical transformation uh, within those spaces and those spaces. And when we uh, have for this free software community in Brazil, a long pause, but also uh, for the Brazilian users of social media platforms, this month pause in have, being able to access uh, X through legal means. <laughs> we have to not not be really noisy in our discourse, but uh, do some time of introspection and think. Do is this something that uh, we want to keep doing? Do we want to keep living that way? And that's one of the reasons that made me uh, delete my uh, Twitter account completely in 20, uh, 2022. Uh, was a discussion uh, that Darius Kazemi, which is the uh, administrator of the instance of Macedon I'm in, friend camp, was having with a couple of people. Uh, do we want, uh, in that case, do we want Twitter to be a canonical place in, on the internet? I am uh, lending Twitter some legitimacy and some credit and merit when I am on that platform and I'm interacting on that platform and think uh, and basically um, messaging to other people that this is an important place to be. And if enough people uh, with enough influence uh, reject that idea and they rethink the ways uh, their other relationships with the internet, maybe we can start something new. And that's what that's the thing that made me uh, abandon Twitter completely in 2022. That's the thing that made me invest my time uh, on the Fedverse for seven years. Uh, and people have been telling me that in their experience of the Fedverse, uh, Brazilian um, users specifically, that they feel that they are returning to that sense of being able to be yourself on the internet again. Uh, oh, I don't have to necessarily have one account on one instance. I can 
have many, many accounts and do whatever I want and transform the way I interact with other people when I use something like the Fediverse because, oh, I, I am, I like photography so I can have a pixel fed account and concentrate that uh, over pixel fed and do other things with my mess on account. Or you can be like me, a mess of things and post in Portuguese and English and Spanish and whatever I want on the same account and uh, concentrate every single thing about me on a single account because uh, there is no algorithm trying to make me be just one thing, like one niche or one community or one aspect of my life. And I really like how Darius specifically uh, has been pushing for a uh, building of smaller instances that are representative of a community. So, oh, it's your neighbors or your friend group. The one thing that connects us all on Friend Camp is the fact that we know Darius. <laughs> and it's, it's such a, uh, an interesting group of people. Uh, I learn that I learn from every single day when I read the local timeline and when I read some of their posts as well. And people that I wouldn't even know or connect with uh, in, I believe in a different uh, paradigm of social media platforms. I wouldn't, I possibly wouldn't connect with them on Twitter uh, because it's not often that you try to see who is connecting with the people you connect, but because we are under the same server uh, with a connection to Darius, we can interact more with each other and learn more from each other. The same thing happened on Macedon Pay and on um, other instances, Brazilian instances like Bantu or Colorides, uh, you have uh, something in common with the people who are there and you ended up creating a network of really interesting people that it, uh, whose interactions uh, with you are more facilitated uh, with those open technologies, those open protocols. I think the thing that makes uh, the Fediverse the true successor to uh, Orkut is that Orkut has this had this paradigm of being centralized and focused on communities. So uh, you had a profile and you had ways to interact one on one with people, but the big thing was uh, all the communities you had there, even communities like I hate waking up early or communities that were based on super niche jokes. They had uh, forums uh, with topics to, for discussions and people would gather there. And the idea was interacting with a community, not interacting one-on-one. -on -one. And as uh, social media, commercial social, social media platforms uh, developed and grew, uh, the paradigm was focusing on one individual. So you follow one person and you interact with that one person or you're you read that one person, you see the things from that one person or from multiple people, and you lose that sense of community. Uh, but on Macedon, it's a mixture. On Macedon and on the Fediverse, many of the, the implementations of Fediverse software is a mixture of both. So you have the aspect of the community, like I said, on friend camp, being all friends of Darius. Uh, you have ways to interact with the whole community, but also one-on-one in a way that is more centralized on your profile, uh, which is why I enjoy, I've been enjoying my stay on the Fediverse uh, for seven years. It, in, in other ways, uh, Orkut, uh, at the time I was an, an adolescent, an adolescent, and now uh, Fediverse as an adult, they have helped me in similar ways. Uh, giving me opportunities to meet people that really care about me and people I really care about, uh, connect over state lines and now over different countries. Uh, I really enjoy that we have uh, today a place where that kind of spirit can live on. I'm not on the Fediverse very often. Um, I've, I... But uh, but what I am, you are one of the people that I I I am sure to follow, and I always learn so much from you, whether it's talking to you in person or reading what you're writing on the Fediverse. Um, I 
I have one question to ask you, I guess, because I, I do think we should do this again, because I have yes. still have like a full sheet of paper of things I want to talk to you about. Um, and I've loved this so much. But the one question I want to ask you just to wrap this up is, do you have an elevator pitch for software freedom? And if so, what is it? Like when people say, you know, you care a lot, you, you know, you do outreach, you talk a lot about these things about free software. You know, what what is free software? What is software freedom? Or if you meet someone who doesn't know what you do, what is your short elevator pitch? Or if you, if you have one. <laughs> I don't have one properly finished, but when I talk to people who have no idea about what I do, and I want to explain to them what software freedom is or uh, what open tools are, I talk about... Uh, Usually the, the most relatable example is their relationship to phones and the way uh, phones can limit you in terms of, oh, I take a picture and there is an algorithm running that makes my face more white or exaggerates certain aspects of my face. And it really has an impact of my self, my, on my self-esteem or the fact that uh, something uh an application like whatsapp has completely abandoned that version of android and you are forced to buy another phone so i talk to them and how there are ways we can reclaim control uh over the things that we use like uh my keyboard for example uh I had a really hard time with a bunch of keyboards that I bought over the years because it required me to use specific software to access certain functions or they uh, had a format, a uh, way, uh, a layout that was really difficult for me to use and it would cause me pain. But there is a community of people who have uh, unfolded the secrets of how to create a keyboard. and they can help you create a keyboard any way you want. Uh, imagination is your only limitation and you can make that keyboard make anything you want, to, want it to make. So if you want to transform your keyboard into a musical instrument, you can <laughs> with a couple of beeps on the PCB. Or if you are tired of um, pressing caps lock or uh, pressing a shift key, you can program it for a long press to give you a capitalized letter, for example, or a symbol. So in many ways, I'm reclaiming something that I never really thought that uh, companies and proprietary software had so much control of. And I'm making something that... Uh, connects me to the things that I use, for example, a computer, the interface that I use in the computer, into something truly mine. It, it, the, re the rewarding experience of having control of something that was giving you a lot of pain, a lot of headache, and also uh, the joy of connecting with other people with the same weird interests or the same weird headaches and finding a solution that can be not only accessed by just you and I, but anyone else in the world. It's, it's really difficult to make sense of that scale. But uh, just like uh, my early 20s, me, uh, when I was translating uh, Macedon to Brazilian Portuguese, didn't have an idea that uh, just translating a couple of strings would make a difference, such a difference for the Brazilian community in the ways they use social media platforms and they create communities. I think it's it's the act of caring so much for other people. You want to share everything you can with them and uh, giving up on the control of only I can do something uh, with it. You too can do something with it. You can completely transform it and you can make you can uh, throw it all away and make something new with the same idea, and not only the idea, but the things that I uh, I've put my time and effort into to make it possible and real and material. 
So, oh, uh, the source code that I created for this keyboard, you can use it and you can mess it up and you can create it something new and you can make uh, a keyboard full of P's if you want, <laughs> just the letter P. <laughs> you can make something silly, but you can make something serious and something that can change the world. That's positively perfect. Um, I, uh, I've loved talking to you, Anna. I, I, thank you so much for making the time and thank you for all of your work with Outreachy, with Software Freedom generally. Um, if people want to read more about your thoughts about, um, about issues around tech, diversity, software freedom, where, what? I am on the Fediverse, uh, Anna at friend.camp. I have a blog called notapplicable.dev. I, there are a couple of talks of mine that were recorded on many different platforms. I have a huge compilation of those and interviews on my blog. And you can also, uh, uh, through a series of intricate rituals, contact me on Mastodon. Maybe if you want to have a one-on-one, -on -one, I can share my email address and we can talk some more about software freedom and any other subject. I'm open to that. So cool. Thank you so much, Anna. This was so much fun and we'll definitely do it again. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.